Well, U.S. President Trump and Russian President Putin. Now, that relationship is drawing new fire yet again. And again, it is because of what Mr. Trump said and didn't say about Mr. Putin. In an interview with the only TV news network that he has not branded fake news, Trump again spoke of his respect for Vladimir Putin with Fox News. But it was when he was asked about Mr. Putin being a killer that the U.S. president couldn't find anything redeeming to say about the very country that he leads now. Take a listen. Do you respect Putin? I do respect him. Do you? Why? Why? Well, I respect a lot of people, but that doesn't mean I'm going to get along with him. He's a leader of his country. Uh, I say it's better to get along with Russia than not. And if Russia helps us in the fight against ISIS, which is a major fight, and Islamic terrorism all over the world, right. major fight, that's a good thing. Will I get along with him? I have no idea. It's He's a killer, though. I won't. Putin's a killer. A lot of killers. You got a lot of killers. Why, you think our country's so innocent? You think our country's so innocent? I don't know of any government leaders that are killers in America. Well, take a look at what we've done, too. We've made a lot of mistakes. I've been against the war in Iraq from the beginning. Yeah, mistakes are different then. A lot of mistakes, okay, but a lot of people were killed. So a lot of right. killers around, believe me. Those comments there from the U.S. president drawing a lot of criticism in the United States as well as around the world. Uh, but it addresses another problem, and that is the riddle of Russia. How do you understand Russia? We decided to ask someone who probably knows Russia better than most people here in the West. She joins us now from Washington. Lisa Dickey is with us. She is the author of Bears in the Streets, Three Journeys Across a Changing Russia. Her book has just come out. You see the cover right there. Lisa joins us tonight from Washington. Lisa, thank you very much for taking the time to be on the day. You know, you are, I, I was reading up on you. This is a fascinating book, by the way. I have to tell our viewers, fascinating. You are like a walking time capsule of Russian history for, th for three very important time periods. Uh, tell us a little bit about what, what it is that you did in Russia. So the book is about three trips I took across Russia. Uh, the first one was in 1995. I went with a photographer named Gary Matoso, starting in Vladivostok on the very far southeastern tip of Russia, and went all the way across and stopped in 11 cities and interviewed people, just ordinary people from all walks of life, rich, poor, young, old, um, and, and posted all of these things to a very early uh, website along the way. So we did this whole trip, and I thought, wow, that's an amazing once-in-a-lifetime trip. And then 10 years later, I thought it would be really interesting to go back and see how all of these people are doing. And so I took another photographer, and I went, and I did the entire trip all over again, same 11 cities, talking to the same people to see how they were doing. Uh, and of course, you know, things in Russia had changed. It was no longer Boris Yeltsin. Now it was President Putin. The economy had gotten better. Uh, and it was just interesting to see how thing, things had changed and how people's lives had changed. And then 10 years after that, in 2015, I went back to Vladivostok and did the entire trip all over again and interviewed all those same people over again uh, to find out how they were doing now. And when you compare the, the people and the places that you saw in 1995 and, the, and 2015, what, is the, what, you know, what was the strongest change or the strongest element um, that stood out? Well, the, big, the biggest change definitely was between 1995 and 2005. If you think about what was going on in 1995, it was only four years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Russian economy was not doing well. The ruble had collapsed. A lot of people were really frightened about their futures. They didn't, you know, financially they were doing very poorly. Uh, they didn't know what was going to happen from day to day. And it was a time of a lot of anxiety for a lot of Russians. And I certainly saw that in the people that I interviewed going across the country. Um, as I say, by 2005, the price of oil had gone up. The Russian economy was definitely doing better. Um, and the individuals that I interviewed were doing better. All but, I think, one of them uh, was financially better off. People were able to travel abroad. People just sort of materially were better off than they had been. And then 2015 was somewhere in between, because uh, in the year and a half before I made that trip in 2015, the ruble once again collapsed. It lost half right. of its value in that 18, 19 month period. And so once again, I was traveling across Russia and people were suffering. They couldn't afford to buy 
things, you know, certainly imported goods, um, if they had any dollar-based loans, which a lot of people do, suddenly they owed twice as much as they did when they took the loan out. Sure. Um, so there was definitely a lot of a lot of hardship now that there didn't seem to be in 2005. We, we've got some of your um, photographs. Um, we're we're going to pull up. Maybe you can walk us through them, um, kind of showing the changes that you documented. Um, the first is of the Vladivostok Lighthouse Keeper. I think we've got a photo from 1995 yes. and 2015 we're looking at. Um, I, I would dare to say that the man we see on the right looks much happier than the one we see on the left. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. When I took first went to the to the lighthouse in Vladivostok in 1995, you know, Vladivostok up until 1991 had been a closed city. Uh, it was not foreigners were not allowed to go there, and in fact, the Vla the lighthouse was a, a, a military installation. And so, when we showed up with you know a camera and you know, hey, we'd like to talk to you, uh, there was definitely a little bit of consternation, more so from from uh, Valentina, the woman, than from her husband. Uh, but then, you know, uh, by the time I came back in 2015, I'd been dropping in on them for 20 years, and it really felt much more like, oh, we're old friends now. You know, this is not so weird anymore that this person's showing up and kind of wandering around the property. And, and these people that you met, uh, Lisa, I, I, what did they tell you uh, about what they, they think of or what they know about um, America? I, I mean, talk to me a little bit about maybe the, the perception, um, you know, cleavage that exists between Americans and Russians. Mm -hmm. It's it's definitely real. Uh, you know, I that too has changed in the 20 years that I've been going there. Certainly in 1995, uh, people felt a lot more warmly towards America. Uh, and now, even before I went, I was reading a lot of things in the in the press over here saying that you know anti-American sentiment was very high. And I certainly found that to be true. You know, going across the country talking to people, a lot of people really don't like our government. Really, really didn't like Barack Obama. Really, just disdainful towards him. And, and why not? Um, and, why not? But what they was were, the Reason? Also very, why, why did they not like him? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they thought, they're, I would ask why, and then they, they would say things like, he's weak, you can't believe what he says, he's, you know, one guy even said, I'm just embarrassed for you that you would ever have such a leader, how could you possibly have elected him? Um, I think, you know, what, whatever Russians know about Barack Obama, they're getting through their own media, and certainly that is, you know, sort of rather well known that, you know, Putin has gradually shut down a lot of the opposition journalism in Russia, and so, you know, they're getting a lot of uh, rather one-sided views of it. Uh, uh, so and, but people were really, really not fans of Obama. Yeah, they were fans of Obama. I mean, yes. if you could go back now and ask them about um, Trump, how do you think they would explain <laughs> this almost, almost a bromance between Trump and Putin? I don't know that they would be able to explain the bromance, but I think that they certainly, you know, I didn't ask a lot of people about Trump because I was there in the fall of 2015 and it was right. I, it was beyond my imagining that he would get the nomination, much less win. Right. Uh, so, but the few people who did volunteer their thoughts about him, they were certainly much more pro him uh, than they were Hillary Clinton, who they also sort of lumped into a category with Barack Obama. Um, so it's, it's really one of those things. I'm not sure. I, I'd be really curious to go back and hear what people have to say, but my guess is that they are, they're very happy that he was elected because clearly I think the, the Russian government is, is happier that he was elected. And when we hear the U.S. president say now that he wants to try to, to improve relations, um, do you think that's something that's realistic? And can, can we put aside the realities of Vladimir Putin and forge a new relationship, or do you think that is something that's just not possible? I think the relationship is so complicated now, and what is so curious to me is how completely it has flipped, where now we have a Republican president who's saying basically we should be closer to Russia, and, you know, and people, you know, in the Democratic Party saying, no, 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 we okay. have to, you know, hold them to the fire, and... And it's it's very curious how that is really flip flop. So it'd be it's it's really difficult to predict. All right, Lisa Dickey, there, the author of Bears in the Streets: Three Journeys Across a Changing Russia. Lisa, thank you very much for taking the time to be on the day. We appreciate it. Thank you.